So moving along, uh, we have some exciting talks this afternoon. The first one uh, typifies how hard it is to do strategic planning in this environment, because as imaginative as you might get, uh, before the ink is dry on your strategic plan, uh, somebody's already done it and it's published in Nature because the technology is moving so fast. And uh, Justin Gallivan, our next speaker, is a, is a case in point. Um, and we'll talk about um, repro reprogramming bacteria to uh, uh, both sense and destroy small molecules. Uh, Justin is in the Department of Chemistry at Emory University and has really done um, foundational work in uh, doing what every synthetic biologist wants to do, and that's build cool stuff. <laughs> Justin? All, All right. Well, thank you for the kind introduction. I want to also thank the organizers. Uh, when I first got the invitation from, from Eddie, I was sitting with, by the computer with my wife, who's a human geneticist, and she sees this email. She says, why is Eddie Rubin emailing you? Because you know she's a geneticist, and I most certainly am not. Uh, I am in the Department of Chemistry, but uh, of course, chemists uh, have been thinking about um, how to take advantage of synthesis to understand many things, as well as make cool stuff for a very, very long time. So intellectually, um, chemistry, I think, is very close to um, synthetic biology, and that's why I'm so interested in it. Um, most of what we've done over the past few years has been basically taking advantage of what nature has given us in terms of its um, building blocks of genes, factories of cells, and applying the principles of evolution to reprogram organisms to do new things. And while we're starting to move into some multicellular organisms, the one I'm going to tell you about today is, of course, much more simple, and that is E. coli. And since this is a genomics meeting, I would just show my numbers. Uh, the E. coli genome is not terribly large uh, compared to the ones that we've heard today. Despite the fact it's been, that sequence has been known for over fift, or 15 years now, we still don't know how the damn thing works. Um, but what I find amazing about this, of course, genomes are just repositories of information, and it doesn't take a lot of information to encode an organism that has a personality, okay? And I teach young people for a living, so if you show them this, they don't know what that is. Um, <laughs> Uh, technology is moving so fast, so this number changes a lot. So the point is, it doesn't take a lot of information to encode some very high-level behaviors, uh, including the ones that are shown here. E. coli are remarkable chemists, which, of course, attracts me to them. They can communicate with one another using small molecules as their language. They can move into response to changing conditions, so if they like the neighborhood they're in, they can stay there. If they see one nearby, they can keep moving towards it or away from one they don't like. And of course, they can replicate themselves every 20 minutes or so when supplied with rich media. And ultimately, they're programmed to do this in a genome that we can obviously manipulate very easily. So I'm going to tell you a story that's, that's evolved over the last couple of years and how we've been interested in engineering bacteria to recognize new molecules, ones that they wouldn't ordinarily care about, seek them out, and possibly um, destroy them. So as I mentioned to you earlier, bacteria actually already know how to sense small molecules, and they do it using protein-based chemoreceptors that are found at the surfaces of the cells. Of course, um, E. coli recognize things that they, they need, so food, amino acids, and sugars, and so on, as well as things they like to avoid, such as extremes of pH and so on. This molecular recognition event is coupled to a change in cell behavior through this flagellar motor. And when this flagellar motor rotates in a counterclockwise direction, the cells run for just a second or two, after which time the direction of rotation of this flagellar motor changes, the filaments that make it up become discorrelated from one another, and the cell tumbles. So if you look at E. coli under a microscope, each one of these cells is about a micron long, and what you'll find is that they alter their behavior. For instance, this one here is tumbling, and then he's going to run away. And what they are actually doing is they are doing a biased random walk. So they can sense gradients of small molecules, and if they're moving up a gradient of something they like, they will tend to keep going in that direction, whereas if they find themselves moving away from something they like, they will turn around and try something else. And in doing so, they can migrate towards the things they like. The way this works is actually very well understood, both biochemically and genetically. Work over uh, the last 40 years or so has revealed that there's an alphabet soup of proteins that take the signal from over here, where the receptors are, to the flagellar motor. And it's been known for 30 years now that if you just knock out one, a protein called key Z, um, the cells no longer run and tumble, they just tumble in place. 
So these are the wild type that you've seen before. These are cells just missing a single gene, and they kind of wiggle and look sad. Um, you don't need a microscope to do this. Uh, you can do this with just a Petri dish. In fact, if you take a Petri dish and you culture cells using a little less agar than you normally would, so this is kind of like a, um, a weak set jello, um, if you put wild type E. coli in the center of the plate, what you find over a period of time is that they migrate out. And what they're doing is they're migrating away and they're eating the nutrients in the plate. And if you look very carefully, you'll notice that they actually form concentric circles. And what's going on there is that the cells that have uh, sort of been at the leading edge, they're following the, the most strong chemoattractant in the media, and there are several. So the ones at the forefront are basically following the tastiest stuff, and they're eating it. So the cells that are left behind still see chemoattractants. However, um, they're less strongly attracted, so they move at a slightly different rate and so on. So that, that's what makes these... Um, concentric circles that we're going to see again. Um, if you delete key Z, the cells just grow on top of one another and um, don't do much. So what we want to be able to do is convert cells that behave like this into cells that behave like that. So obviously the, the chemical problem we need to solve is we need to turn on expression of key Z, but ideally in response to a molecule that we're interested in and not necessarily something that the cell would normally care about. So for the last um, 10 years or so, my lab has been very interested in these molecules known as riboswitches. Um, riboswitches are most often found in prokaryotes, but they also exist in eukaryotes as well, typically plants. Um, and uh, riboswitches uh, control gene expression in the following manner. They consist of an RNA, which is called an aptamer. An aptamer is an RNA sequence that binds to another molecule, typically a small molecule, you know, something low molecular weight below 500, for example. Upon binding that small molecule, the RNA undergoes a conformational change that ultimately leads to a change in gene expression. And this can occur via a variety of different mechanisms involving both transcription as well as translation as well as RNA stability. Um, but what unites all of them is that a small molecule interacts with an RNA aptamer to control gene expression. So riboswitches entered the vernacular in 2002 when it was recognized that bacteria took advantage of this mechanism to control metabolism. But the term aptamer had been around significantly longer, in fact, since around 1990, um, when Jack Shostak and Larry Gold independently showed that they could sort through very large, and by large I mean 10 to the 12, 10 to the 13, 10 to the 14 random RNA sequences and by doing an in vitro selection experiment that I'll tell you a little bit more about later, they could isolate functional sequences. And here's a rather famous one that was published um, in 1994. So this is a 38 nucleotide um, RNA sequence that basically folds back upon itself. And the reason that this was published in a tabloid journal is that this RNA sequence recognizes theophylline, this molecule shown here, with a very tight binding constant. Okay? So, um, Whereas caffeine, which looks very similar, um, just has a bonus methyl group at this position, is bound 10,000-fold less well. So previously, it was, it was generally assumed that if you wanted to recognize a small molecule using a biomolecule, you needed a protein to do it. And this paper, as well as others, dispelled that notion. It showed that RNA was not only capable of binding small molecules tightly, it could also distinguish between structurally related molecules as well. So we uh, and others, including uh, Christina in the back of the room, um, have been interested in taking advantage of using these RNA um, aptamers to help control gene expression. And a number of years ago, we showed that we could take um, an aptamer sequence, and by cloning it upstream of the ribosome binding site of a reporter gene, we introduced that into E. coli. And when we plated these cells on either the absence of a small molecule or in the presence of caffeine, which as you recall, does not bind to this aptamer, the cells look normal, but when we added theophylline, the cells turned blue. Now normally E. coli don't care much about theophylline, they don't metabolize it strongly in the presence of other tasty things that are in this media. So what this showed was that we could get cells to turn on gene expression in response to a non-metabolite, something that they hadn't um, cared about much before. Over the years, we've gotten fairly good at selecting riboswitches from libraries that have additional function, which is to say, our first switches were basically leaky. In the absence of ligand, there was some gene expression, and in the presence of ligand, the, the, 
the, the activation was not as robust as we would have liked. Um, over the years, we've gotten good, and this, this, this work is published, at developing ribosome switches that in the absence of ligand show very little gene expression, and in the presence of ligand, they show a very high level of induction, in some cases exceeding that of natural ribosome switches. And this is actually um, useful, um, we think, because as, as has come up earlier, ma many of the bacteria that exist, including you know, most, um, are not particularly as, as highly studied as E. coli. Um, in fact, many lack very good genetic tools that if you want to ask a simple question, hey, if I turn this gene on or turn this gene off, what does it do? We, we don't have inducible promoters, for example, uh, that we have in E. coli. Everybody knows we can turn genes on using IPTG induction um, with a little bit of molecular biology, but for the vast majority of species, we can't do that. We figured ribose switches would be useful for that um, because they are comprised of RNA, and they typically only interact with the small molecule that we supply and the ribosome, which tends to be conserved. We figured that these would work well, and in fact they do. With a little bit of tweaking um, of the sequences, we were able to take uh, switches that could activate gene expression in E. coli and get them to work in other organisms, including some nasty bugs like S. pyogenes and TB. Um, this lacked tools completely. This doesn't have very many. Um, as well as Agrobacterium tumefaciens, I know a number of you are working on plants. This, of course, is an or a bacterium that does interkingdom gene transfer. Um, we can now think about triggering that using uh, small molecules as well. But getting back to this story, can we use these ribose switches to control how cells behave? Um, and the question, of course, then is, can we use this ribose switch to turn on expression of key Z in the presence of a, of a small molecule? So the questions that we asked were, first of all, will the cells run when this molecule is present? If so, um, if we're lucky or good, will the cells actually follow this ligand? So here's just a, a control experiment. Um, this molecule gets me out of the bed in the morning. However, it does not magically rescue cells that are deficient in the key Z gene. So, and nor does the offlin. And of course, this is not surprising. If we add a ribose switch that controls um, key Z, what we find is different. Um, Caffeine doesn't bind, the cells don't move, and now theophylline um, binds, and, and you see that the cells move. Now, again, I was raised as, a, as an organic chemist, so we were taught to be rigorously quantitative. You always have to measure something, um, typically plot two things against one another. So we used a very high-throughput, high high-tech device to measure the behavior of this. Um, we used a ruler, and what we showed is that um, uh, as you add more of the ligand, the cells move further, and at very high concentrations, they get sick, so they don't move very much at all. Um, so that was nice. Then we said, okay, the cells move. Can we get them to follow this ligand? And to do that, what we did was we took a Petri dish and basically painted out a little obstacle course where we put theophylline going to the right, um, tryptone, which is bacterial food, going up, and then caffeine going to the left, and we watched the cells and saw, saw what they did. So we started them out here, and if you take wild-type cells and you start them there, we knew that they were going to move, so we made them green with green fluorescent protein, and naturally they move, um, and they, they move out um, in all directions. There's no asymmetry introduced by the presence of these small molecules, because wild-type E. coli don't really care about them. Um, Cells lacking key Z, we knew weren't going to move, so we made them red, and of course they sit where you started them. If you add our switch to the mix, you all know what's coming next, is that the cells actually migrate out, and then they make a right turn. So this was appealing to me, as, as, again, as an organic chemist. Here are cells that at the population level are moving out, and you know, to be anthropomorphic, deciding to, to, to migrate um, towards one compound and not the other, that differ really only by the presence of a methyl group. So we did a lot of mechanistic work to understand that, that's, that's been published. But, but ultimately, of course, having done this for a while, we, you know, Theophylline's a, a perfectly respectable molecule, but perhaps not the most interesting one out there. I'm not going to say that this one is in particularly, you know, maybe more significant, um, but it's different. And we picked atrazine uh, as a target for a couple of reasons. This is the most, um, one of the most widely used herbicides in the U.S. Um, they spray over 35,000 tons of this um, on crops each year, mostly corn to, to, to cut down weeds. Um, 
this is a big number. Um, the number in Europe or in the EU is zero because it has been banned. It has been implicated um, in causing developmental defects uh, in aquatic life. Um, this is also a big number. Um, if, to put that into perspective, that's the mass of 186 Boeing 747-400s, and that's what we put in the ground each year. And if you believe Wolfram Alpha, this is about five to six times greater than the mass of gold ever removed from the Earth in its history. Okay, so we dump a lot of this, and, and it's useful. I mean, it kills weeds and it cuts, it, it you know, lets the corn grow. But of course, when you spray this much of anything, it's going to get in places you don't want. So uh, contamination has been reported, and there was a Sunday A1 above the fold article in the Times a couple of summers ago, basically asking the question, um, you know, debating how much weed killer is safe in your drinking water. So um, this is starting to get some attention. So the question that we asked was, can we engineer cells to recognize this compound and possibly uh, not just follow it, but actually break it down into something less toxic? So to do that, we have to solve a chemistry problem. This is a molecular recognition problem. We have to get these RNA aptamers that bind to atrazine. And we set a slightly higher bar for ourselves in that um, when atrazine is broken down microbially, it's broken down to this molecule, hydroxyatrazine. Um, hydroxyatrazine uh, has a couple of attractive characteristics. One is considered less toxic, substantially less toxic than atrazine, and it is known to be more strongly adsorbed to soil than atrazine. So um, atrazine can move more freely through the watershed than hydroxyatrazine can. But we wanted to make sure that our engineered organisms would only go after this as a starting material and not get hung up on the product that looks very similar. So to do this, we have to find these aptamers, which means that we start with um, very large, in my mind, very large libraries of random DNA sequences. And although the E. coli genome is quite small, this number is actually fairly large. So what we're doing is we're starting with approximately 10 to the 14 um, different sequences. They're, they're typically um, randomized 40 nucleotides, but there are 10 to the 14 copies of that. And if, I, if my math is correct, and I understand what Eddie said, the, the JGI has sequenced 30,000 gigabases. Is that right? So it's about 10 to the 13. Okay. So we've got more uh, in, in terms of sequence um, at the beginning of this experiment. Okay, so, so the challenge is to winnow this down into s the functional sequences. And what we do is we apply, again, this Celex method that was developed by Gold um, and Shawstack. And the idea is that we take this DNA sequence, we um, amplify it, convert it into RNA. We take those RNAs and we wash them down a column that has atrazine bound to it. We basically look for what sticks. We can, if we desire, wash with buffer or with um, hydroxyatrazine to get rid of the cheaters. Um, and then by iterating this cycle, we can hopefully select sequences that recognize atrazine with um, high affinity. So just, just to show you some data, what we're looking at is we're looking at the fraction of the RNA pool that is binding to this atrazine-containing column. And at the beginning of the experiment, it's not surprisingly very low, but um, relatively rapidly we see an increase. Nobody knows what happened in round six. I do know what happened at round 10. What we did was we did a competition experiment where we applied the RNAs to um, the atrazine-containing column, and then we washed with hydroxyatrazine, this, this breakdown product, as a competitor. So as you'll see, most of the sequences um, got washed away, which is to say they were non-selective. So we took what was left behind and could be eluded with atrazine, and we continued the selection. Now, at the end of the day, um, this, this, was, this was done a few years ago, where, where it was not easy to sequence, you know, for instance, all of the, the, the um, compound, or all of the different RNAs here. We, we make a guess that it's probably somewhere on the order of a million different sequences. Um, but we, what we knew was that the pool here was diverse and that a good portion of them had some pretty high, moderate to high affinity to this atrazine column. So then the question becomes, which ones are actually going to function in the context of one of these riva switches? And the, the challenge there is that historically when people had selected for aptamers, they had focused very squarely on optimizing ligand binding because they wanted to do things like diagnostics where it made sense to detect very low concentrations of the small molecule. So what they're doing is they're optimizing a thermodynamic parameter 
But Rivas switches have to solve two problems. They not only have to bind something, but they have to undergo some sort of conformational change, which is a kinetic problem. We don't know how to solve that yet. So what we did was we took all of the sequences um, that had displayed some ability to bind to atrazine, and we cloned them upstream of some random nucleotides um, in front of that key Z gene that I told you about um, earlier that controls cell motility. And the experiment is actually very simple. We take all those possibilities, we plate them on media in the absence of atrazine, and we pick the cells that don't move. We did that for two rounds, and then we pick the cells that moved. And the beautiful thing here is that we have a functional assay, so we're looking at millions of different possibilities, um, and they basically tell the story of how they work um, by how far they move. So cells that move out here versus cells that move um, half as far have gene expression on twice as much. So it's actually, it's, it's a very nice screen if you're looking for um, uh, gene activity. At the end of the day, we found a, a clone that in the absence of atrazine does not move very much. In the presence of atrazine, uh, admittedly a high concentration, it starts to move. Um, the switch is, in fact, um, selective. We tried to have switches that would recognize atrazine and not hydroxyatrazine, and that's the case here. Hydroxyatrazine does not activate the switch. Atrazine does. It's still a very modest level of induction, um, about um, a fourfold increase in gene expression, but enough to produce a phenotype that um, is, is interesting. And we're starting to understand what, why the, this apparent limitation is, is occurring, and I'll mention that in just a little bit. So we have cells that can seek atrazine. Can we get cells to um, seek and destroy atrazine? Now, atrazine provides a very interesting evolutionary story because this is a completely synthetic molecule. It was introduced in either 1959 or 1960, depending on where, you, um, where um, it was applied. Um, and within about 10 years, uh, atrazine uh, catabolizing bacteria were isolated basically everywhere that they had um, used this stuff on multiple continents. And Larry Wackett at the University of Minnesota was studying these organisms, and what he found was that there were three genes involved in atrazine catabolism. Um, that got it down to something that could tie into existing pathways. Um, the first is the one that breaks atrazine down to hydroxyatrazine. And what he showed is that if you um, express that gene in E. coli, um, and these cells are plated on a high concentration of atrazine. In, in fact, it's so high that it actually starts to precipitate out of the medium. Um, what you see around this growing cells are these halos, and what's happening is that the cells have actually broken down atrazine into hydroxyatrazine, um, and hydroxyatrazine happens to be more soluble in the media than atrazine is. So we're going to look for that clearing, sort of like melting snow, um, as evidence that um, uh, the cells are breaking it down. So if we take our cells that have our riboswitch and they don't have atrazine A, um, we plated them at the center, they migrated out across. Um, the bright field images are, are complicated by the presence of a lot of atrazine, which is, is visible. Um, if you take cells and we now give them atrazine A, um, what you find is that the cells actually migrate out, and we do see these clearing regions, these alternating light and dark circles. Um, and what, what we are able to show is that the reason, in fact, that these we expected to see some clearing. We weren't originally expecting the circles. But as something I told you earlier, what's actually going on is that the, there's, there are other chemoattractants in the media. So the cells that are on the outmost edge have gone, and they're migrating, and they're eating their favorite chemoattractant. And at the same time, they're also eating atrazine. And at some point, they eat enough atrazine that they sort of box themselves in, because they need atrazine to move. Whereas the cells that were behind are moving at a slower rate, they're also eating atrazine, um, so they move a little less far. And if you actually just take out all the chemoattractants except for one, you get one ring. If you had two chemoattractants, you get two, and so on. Um, but, 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 but definitely the, the clearing reasons are, are consistent with atrazine degradation, and we have HPLC data that, that shows um, that as well. So, so just in the last few minutes, I'm. I'm going to just tell you about what we've been thinking about and working on um, over the last uh, year or so. And the question that I really 
wanted to answer, this is actually something my, my program officer at the Air Force asked, and it was something that I'd been asking. Uh, we were doing a lot of applied work, and he said, no, 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 we want basic research. And I said, well, hey, if my program officer wants to pay me to do basic research, I will absolutely um, do basic research on the problems that I'm interested in. So, so we were interested in what makes a good RIVAS switch. And as I mentioned to you earlier, RIVAS switches have two problems they have to solve. They have to bind this ligand, and they have to modulate gene expression. Um, and up until this point, I think it's fair to say that most ribose switches um, that we've, uh, I don't know, well, let me just say, bind the ligand. So this is a thermodynamic problem, modulate gene expression is a kinetic problem. And I would argue that the current approaches that, that we have used to select ribose switches have done very well at solving this problem, but have largely ignored this one. And I think we've done that sort of to our peril in that some of our RIVA switches bind their ligands very tightly, but they don't switch very fast and so on. So we need to find ways of, of solving this kinetic problem. And um, so we've started to work on this, and I'll tell you why it's, we think it's so important. Here's an example of um, a, a ligand, cyclic DIGMP. This is actually bound by a natural ribose switch that's found in bacteria. So bacteria uses this, um, uh, the ribose switch, to sense cyclic G DIGMP levels to, to regulate metabolism. Now there are some that believe, as do I, that ribose switches in the, in the natural world are actually fossils from an RNA world. That is to say, they've existed for billions of years, nature evolved them in an RNA world to bind to things they needed, like um, cofactors like S adenosyl methionine and so on. And it makes sense that if they were evolved to bind cofactors to do chemistry, in an RNA world, you competed by binding your cofactor tightly so that your neighbor couldn't do so, okay? So you won. So it made sense that the original aptamers evolved very impressive binding constants. And in fact, when we select them in the lab, we try and get very typically try and get very impressive binding constants. But this is an example, I think, of why nature may have you know, sort of backed itself into a bit of a corner in that the RNA that recognizes this binds it with picomolar um, affinity, and which is exceedingly tight for any weak interaction. Um, this is one of the tightest that's out there. And the way that the RNA achieves this is that it doesn't bind the ligand that fast, but it doesn't let go. Once it binds, it takes essentially you know, 43 days for um, half of that population to let go. Now, consider what's going on in a cell. E. coli live for, say, about 20 minutes. And you know, we can quibble about this and say it's 60 minutes, but the point is it is not 43 days. Average RNA lifetime in a cell is about six minutes, transcription is very fast, and the concentration of a single molecule in E. coli, since E. coli are very small, if you have just one molecule in there, it rises to nanomolar concentration. If you want to make a switch that detects something at nanomolar concentration, you don't want to use something that binds it with picomolar affinity because it would be saturated all the time. It wouldn't be a switch. So what this tells us is that this and probably many other RIVA switches actually aren't equilibrium or thermodynamically driven. They're kinetically driven. So we really have to develop ways to bind ligands quickly because the decisions that the cell has to make occur on a, a very short time scale. So what we've been doing, and we're, we're not terribly far along, is we've been developing some selections that are sort of agnostic to this mechanism of action. So instead of taking the traditional route of selecting for aptamers that bind very tightly and then grafting on switching in an ad hoc manner, we're trying to actually select for ribose switches um, in a direct way. And in doing so, we're also trying to make these selections easier to, to um, to, to, to be performed by those that are not um, experts in RNA biochemistry or organic chemistry. So instead of taking months or years um, to get a ribose switch, we want to be able to do this essentially in a, a few weeks, and it pains me to say this as a chemist, sort of reduce or eliminate the need for synthetic chemistry so that anybody that wants to create a new um, ribose switch to control a gene in response to their favorite molecule um, can do so. so how does this tie into genomics? Well, a problem that I'm interested in, and one, um, of course, that uh, you know, years ago would have been very difficult and is now becoming within our grasp, is that ultimately at the end of these um, 
uh, uh, projects, we typically end up with around a dozen or so sequences that have some function that we actually take a look at. But remember where we started. We started at 10 to the 14, and we got to here. So I think now we, we and we're certainly looking for help in doing this, what we're trying to understand is basically follow this selection scheme from very large numbers, and I know we're not gonna get quite here, but we would like to know what's going on when certain sequences or families of sequences start disappearing um, and others start to dominate the pool. So we wanna basically replay what is a selection experiment, not quite an evolution experiment, but a selection, and actually watch it in, in in a historical sense, to actually learn how this works. And as something that uh, the ever provocative Steve Benner mentioned last night in the question period, um, again, sequencing is something that we do a lot of, but we tend not to think of it as a, you know, he said this would offend the German chemists that you know, have very precise data. Uh, what we'd actually like to be able to do is bring sequencing into the domain of spectroscopy. So basically that uh, as organic chemists, um, we, we like to have very precise data, so can we um, use sequencing as really a way of, of, of providing a history of, of, of what is going on here. So let me just summarize by saying, uh, hopefully I've told you that synthetic ribose switches are useful for controlling gene expression um, in a wide range of bacteria. And I mentioned to you just two ligands, theophylline and atrazine. In principle, this could be any ligand that we want. Okay, so these selections, we could use lots of different ligands. We're obviously very interested in doing that, but the fact is it's been difficult. And I think Christina can attest to the fact that there are still only a handful of ligands um, that uh, 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 can activate ribose switches. So we'd like to, of course, make it easier to do that because we think it will be very useful to control, if you can use any small molecule to control any gene that you want, you really have the opportunity to program complex uh, phenotypes, which is really going to be enabling for synthetic biology. And hopefully, um, sequencing will ultimately be our high-resolution spectroscopy in these experiments. So with that, I just want to thank all the folks that, that did the work. Um, those that are shown in blue have moved on to greener pastures. Those that are shown in black are still around. Um, uh, specifically, the atrazine stuff was done primarily by Joy um, and Sam with some help from Shana. And I also want to thank the folks that have funded the work and you for your attention. I think we have time for a few questions. Any questions? See one? Uh, Ramon Sknaska's Big Low Lab. Uh, so I'm wondering, uh, in the big scheme of gene regulation, is there a particular niche that ribose switches fill? Are there particular functions that they regulate? So most of the question was, you know, what, what is the niche that ribose switches um, uh, fill? So where they've been discovered most often are in bacteria, and the pathways that they regulate seem to be basically primary metabolism. So often it is biosynthesis of things like amino acids, uh, synthesis of B12, S adenosyl methionine. And if you think back, and again, if, as, as I do, I think that these were probably vestiges from an RNA world where it made sense to recognize metabolites, many of which have nucleic acid-like appendages. So cyclic di-GMP has a nucleobase in it, and S adenosyl methionine has a nucleobase. So it made sense that these were around and that nature could basically take advantage of them to control primary metabolism. Of course, proteins do things pretty well also, um, but you know, if nature has something lying around in the toolbox, it, it made sense that it would use it. Um, there are examples of ribose switches in eukaryotes, but they are certainly not as, as many as in bacteria where they're widely spread. Are, I have one quick question. Are the limits here? Oh. <laughs> the, the limits of, of small molecules are just that they, of the size of, of molecules sensed, is just that they've got to get into the cell to be sensed? They have or? to get into the cell, and obviously they have to be non toxic. But there's a natural ribose switch that responds to glycine, which is pretty damn small. There's one that responds to magnesium, which <laughs> you really don't get much smaller than that. Um, I think, you know. For anything, there's going to be some issue with mass transport. Yeah, you have to get into the cell. 
we're, gonna, we're arguing now that not only do you have to get into cell, but you have to get into cell at concentrations that you can compete against kinetics. Um, but when I look at the structures of molecules that have been recognized by aptamers, I never cease to be amazed. I, I used to think, no, that would never work. And you see examples of even just very hydrophobic molecules that can be recognized. Other questions? Given your experience with aptamer design in the past, uh, if somebody were to give you a new small molecule, how long would it take you to de design a, a chemotactic bacteria? Well, it, well, design, I think, is a strong word, right? I mean, we're, we're in fact doing a, a selection, a fishing expedition. So, so what has limited this in the past, I think, if you go back in the literature to aptamers that exist, almost all of them had been that have been raised against small molecules, almost all of them were raised against sequences that you could buy attached to a column from sigma. So we're chemists, so we can get around that by making things. So you know, the question is how complicated is the molecule? You know, that, that certainly factors into it. What we're trying to do now in these selections is to actually avoid that synthetic chemistry step completely. So the selections would occur completely in solution. You wouldn't need to know any chemistry. You would just need to have the molecule present and then iterate. Um, Aptamer selection can take a few weeks, and then by converting to a Riva switch, you know, adds on to that. But as I said, I think that's, we've been doing it that way for a while, and it's not the right way to do it, because we're moving in this direction, and then trying to go in that direction, where we may be causing problems for ourselves by moving too far. So we're, now we're trying to develop direct selections that hopefully will be on the order of a few weeks. <laughs> I think we have time for one more. Sorry if I missed this, but are, are you doing sequencing between the selection rounds to try to figure out which sequences are being enriched, and, and can you use that information rationally, if so? So, so we have done sequencing, but uh, you know, as costs have driven down, we have not done deep sequencing, which I think is, would be very good because we have very short regions where we can get a lot of reads. So in the past, we've looked at you know, a few hundred sequences one at a time and just got a sense you know, do we have three things in the pool or do we have many things, <laughs> many being arbitrarily large? But I think now as the costs have come down, we can start thinking about replaying this experiment from a small number of sequences at the end, going back to see you know, what happened and when. I think that will teach us something about selection. Okay, thank you, thank you very much.